Father, we pray, uh, even as your word is lifted up here, Lord God, that uh, you would pour out your spirit upon us here this day, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Woo, that was real good. Amen. Thank you. We're going to think about a power beyond ourselves. So when I was 15 years old and uh, I was at a huge youth rally up in Ocean City, New Jersey, out in that pavilion that goes out over the ocean there, and I'm seated on the floor with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other high school students, and uh, there's a speaker up front, and I feel something coming over me. This had happened to me once before at another youth retreat, and that time I got up and ran into the woods. I didn't know what was happening. But this time, uh, the speaker invites people to come up to pray, and I felt like I was glued to the floor. This time, I knew it was Jesus. I knew it was God. But I just felt like I was glued to the floor. I couldn't, couldn't get up there. But I went to my youth leader that night, and uh, he said, well, Craig, it's, it's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. And I'm like, okay. He said, well, Craig, open the door. And I said, uh, okay. How do I do that? He opened up the Bible. He, he read me a verse from the book of Revelation. Here's the first verse of the Bible I ever memorized, verse Chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will let him in and eat with him and he with me. He read me this verse, and I said, okay. He said, well, Craig, pray something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And so I prayed that prayer. And um, I knew it happened. I, I, and I could understand the part about forgiveness. I mean, I knew something happened. I, I knew that was a real prayer. I knew it was from deep in my heart. I knew that this was Jesus who was somehow drawing near to me. And so I prayed this prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. And I, I kind of understood about the cross and forgiveness. And uh, I certainly understood about my sin. And, but, you know, when I prayed that prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I was kind of thinking of it like, you know, you hold the people that you love in your heart. They're always with you. I was kind of thinking of it kind of like symbolically, like, okay, Jesus will always be in my heart. I'll just always love him. I'll hold him close to my heart. I was thinking of it kind of symbolically. But I knew something happened. And then maybe, I don't know, a month or two later, I'm, I'm hearing this same youth leader that I prayed with, and he's teaching, he's reading from the Bible about the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, okay, the Holy Spirit. So what I'm thinking was like school spirit. So I'm thinking this is Jesus spirit. And I'm, I've got, G that's what I was praying for, to have Jesus spirit, to always be excited about Jesus. And uh, so I remember actually talking to that same youth leader again, a guy named Dave. And, uh, and he said, no, Craig, this is God himself. He said, Craig, when you prayed for Jesus to come into your heart, you weren't praying about an idea. You weren't praying about a feeling. You were asking Jesus. You were asking the Lord God himself, the one God who's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You were asking him to come and dwell in your heart. Craig, you asked him, and he came. And so imagine if what we had from Jesus was uh, the one who, yes, went to the cross uh, to pay the price of our sins so we would be forgiven, the one who then teaches us, okay, now, Craig, look, I've forgiven your sin. Now, here, here's how I want you to live. This is what I want you to do and not do. And, Craig, great, go do it. And we'd be like, Okay, great, but uh, I failed over and over and over again, and yeah. Uh, I mean, I was a person who knew right and wrong. My parents had raised me well and taught me right and wrong. So it wasn't like now I knew right and wrong. I already knew right and wrong. Okay, I had my sin forgiven. Now I'm just going to go out there and try again. That's it. But what Jesus promised is something much greater. He promised not only for that forgiveness of sin, not only the wisdom of teaching us how to live, but he promised us then a power and a strength, the power of his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, as Paul says, the, the Holy Spirit of, of God. He promised to send the Spirit of God to our hearts. The same God who put the stars in the sky, who filled the oceans, who holds the whole universe in his hands. 
this infinite God who holds what is, in fact, a finite universe. I thought the universe was infinite. That's what I was taught when I was a kid. I'm so glad my father pointed out to me uh, that even the greatest scientist, Albert Einstein, said, no, the, the universe is finite. That's this whole thing, uh, um, E equals MC squared. You all understand that, right? You got that, right? Yeah, I never did get it, but my father said, look, he proved it, that the the universe is finite, and Albert Einstein, agnostic that he was, nevertheless knew there had to be something infinite holding this finite universe. So this infinite God who holds the whole universe in his hands, who knit me together in my mother's womb, who put all the stars in the sky, this infinite God and all of his power comes to the deepest place in our hearts and in our lives, that we might have the strength, the courage, the determination to be the people that he calls us to be. And so what we're going to look at this morning is uh, basically two words, a promise and the word surrender, promise and surrender. How, so if we have this Jesus who promises to, to, to give us this power, how do we grab hold of that, that power? Uh, so we're going to look, we're going to begin, it's in Luke chapter 24, and we're going to be looking at how it was that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, worked in the life of Jesus. When I was first uh, trying to understand Jesus, I, I got the fact that he was God, This wasn't just some human being that God chose to do all these things, but this was God himself who came and uh, and walked this earth. Uh, So I I understood this was God, but that meant to me, well, he must have been like Superman. He must have had all the power of being God, and nothing could be difficult for him. He could just do what, you know, whatever he needed to do. What I didn't understand was that the Bible makes very plain, no, when he left heaven, he he left the power of being God, the omnipotence, being all-powerful, omniscience, being all-wise. He left all that in heaven and was conceived in Mary's womb, born as a, a, a little baby there in Bethlehem with all the weaknesses and the limitations of, hum, of humanity. So he was fully God, but fully human. He depended upon the Father in heaven, sending to him the Holy Spirit. The power would be sent to him from heaven. He didn't come as Superman with that power in himself. Uh, That power would be sent to him. So we're going to look at how the power of God, the Spirit of God, came to Jesus and see then what that means in our lives. Because he promises that same power to you and me. He even said to his disciples one time, the things that I do, you will do. And even greater things than I do, you will do. It's amazing. But what it says to me is that whatever mountain I need to climb, whatever challenge I have to face, whatever seems to be beyond me, there is a power within me. There's a power that that Jesus has sent to me that I can climb that mountain and meet that and challenge. You know, it's, it's different for everyone, right? It might be that you are consumed with an anger and an unforgiveness towards someone who's done you a great wrong. It might be you have some pattern of behavior that you've never been able to change. It might be that uh, you just know this task that God has set in front of you. It might simply be to just make it through this season of life that you're in that is just exceedingly difficult. We can all do many things in our own strength and in our own power, but when we realize uh, the life that God has truly called us to live, the people that he has truly called us to be, these things are beyond us, and we need a power beyond us. They were what what God the Father was calling Jesus to do was beyond Jesus. Jesus had to receive from the Father the Spirit of God, the power of God to do Uh, what he did. So we're going to look in the gospel of Luke. It's chapter 24. And the very last words that Jesus says to his disciples, uh, he uh, went to that cross on a Friday, died there on a Friday. The father raised him up on a, uh, on a Sunday. Uh, Mary Magdalene was the first person to see him risen from the dead. Then the disciples, then he spent uh, 40 days with them. They actually went back up to Galilee, leaving Jerusalem. They came back down to Jerusalem. There were about 120. That's all that were left of the followers of Jesus, 120 
persons. And Jesus uh, spoke many things to them during those, those 40 days. And so the, la and the last thing that he had said was, now go to all nations. Take uh, what you've seen in me, what you've heard from me, take it to all nations, to all people. And so at verse 48, he says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the, the promise of my Father upon you. So I'm sending, so you've, you've heard what I've said to you, you've seen what I've, I've done, you've seen how I've lived before you. Think of Peter and John and the others there uh, remembering these things that he did, that time he was in the synagogue and the man with the withered hand and, and all the Pharisees who were so jealous of Jesus and skeptical of him and, and Jesus comes to pray with this man and all these guys are just hypocritically like ready to pounce on Jesus and say, you know, you're not supposed to be praying with that man today, it's the Sabbath day, et cetera, et cetera. They were ready and Jesus knew it. They were ready to string this guy up. They were ready to hang him on a cross, throw him over a cliff. But Peter and John watched as nevertheless Jesus walked right through that fear and prayed for that man, and that man was healed. So they saw that, right? And they knew Jesus was calling them to have uh, that same courage in their hearts. But it was beyond them. And so he says, you're witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, a promise of power, a promise of his Holy Spirit. He says, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So he makes a promise to them. If I'm thinking about the power, this power beyond myself, the first thing is I need to know that there has been a promise made to me that God will give me this power, this strength, this courage, this determination that I need. He has promised. Jesus promised it to his disciples. He promises it uh, to each one of us. So he says, but stay here in Jerusalem. This hasn't happened yet, he says to them. Stay here, wait in this city until you are clothed with power, until this power comes to your life. If we look over in the book of Acts in chapter 2, uh, there at verse 1, so 10 days later, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together. So Jesus, right after he said those words he had said, he, he ascended to heaven. 10 days later, 120 of them, all of his followers, on this Jewish holiday of Pentecost, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided uh, tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. So they're all together, they hear this sound like a rushing wind, they see what looks like fire coming and resting on them. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So the promise that Jesus made, he fulfills. He sends to them the Spirit of God now. And it says they were all, not some of them, not just John or Peter or kind of like the leaders, but all of them, he says, were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, in other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Why, why is that happening? Well, this task that Jesus had given them to go to all nations, they all were just Galileans from this one little rural region of Gal Galilee, and they all spoke one language, Aramaic. How are we going to do what you've told us to do, to go to all nations? Well, right at the beginning, as Jesus keeps his promise of sending power to them, he, he, he works, this, the Spirit of God works through them, showing them, look, you can do whatever I call you to do. Look, you are speaking in languages you don't even know to persons you don't know, telling them the goodness of God. So if I'm thinking about how do I grab hold of this, this promise, how do I grab hold of the power that God sends uh, to his children, I, I do it, first of all, simply by this, knowing that a promise has been made, that he has promised to send that power. So if I'm looking at that mountain that I have to climb, if I'm looking at this thing that I have to do, I have to know then and trust that he has promised to give me the strength to do whatever I need to do. I have to trust that. He had told them, go to all nations, and so he sent his spirit to them that they would be able to speak the languages of all nations. So whatever your task is, whatever is beyond you right now, Know this, the Father has promised to send his spirit, the power of God, to your heart so that you can do what you have to do. Maybe you have just uh, an awareness that there is this calling on your life that you've been avoiding. There's this thing that you know that God is calling you to do, 
but you have been avoiding it. Believe, trust this promise. Trust this promise that God gives the power that we need uh, to us. He, he gave it to his, his first disciples. Uh, he will give it, give it to us. A lot of time we don't do what God's asked us to do because we don't take even the first step. Uh, when Moses, uh, you remember, uh, is uh, uh, calling them uh, to, you know, he's leading them out of their slavery uh, from, from Egypt. And uh, so they, they, they leave and they look back and now the army is after them, but the, the, the Red Sea is in front of them, right? This is impossible. It's an impossible thing. Now they're trapped. Now they're doomed. Now they're all going to be dead. But Moses walks up to the edge of the sea and lifts that staff up. He had to. Now, how foolish is that to walk up to an ocean and lift up a rod, a staff? But he had to take this step of faith, trusting in the promise of God. The power that he needed to lead these people to freedom would be there for him. You remember when, uh, uh, so they, 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 of course, the sea parts. They go through. They're wandering in the wilderness for many years. Now they come to, uh, to, to the land uh, to go in. Moses now has died. Now Joshua is their leader. And the, the Jordan River, which at times is, is low and just, uh, uh, you know, in the dry season, not much water, but uh, rushes in the spring uh, a, a, a raging river. They're there when the river's raging, and the Lord tells Joshua, lead them through the river. Lead them across the river. And uh, I noticed that he sent the, uh, the priests up front, the, the preachers, you know, go first. But um, so, so what do they have to do? They've got to put, what does it say very plainly and specifically for us? Step into the water. They had to step in. They couldn't wait for God to do something. They had to step into the water, trusting in this promise that the power would be there to stop that raging river for them to walk across on into the land. And so you and I have this promise made to us that God will provide the power, the strength, the courage, the determination that we need by his spirit. So let's look then, okay, so we have a promise, but how do we grab hold of that promise? Most of us who, who have some level of faith, who have some love for God in, in our lives, uh, we don't doubt God. And so we might say, well, you know what, I really don't doubt his promise. I know that, that he will send and has sent his, his, his Holy Spirit to me. He's sent power to me. It's just me I doubt. It's just, I, I, I just doubt that I'll be able to grab hold of that power. So let's look at Jesus now and see what was it that happened then that Jesus did to grab hold of the power that the Father would send uh, to him. So let's look in Luke, uh, first of all, in Luke chapter 3. So here we see the account of Jesus being baptized uh, by that man, John, the one we call John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. So down at verse 21 there, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. So Jesus comes, all the people are baptized. Uh, John is preaching a, a message of repentance of sin. If you read some of the accounts of John's preaching to the people, uh, he just laid them low. And uh, so they're all coming, confessing their sins. Uh, they're going into the water. Uh, we read not here in Luke, but in Matthew, uh, when John sees that it's Jesus coming, he says, uh, whoa, no, you need to baptize me. And Jesus said, no, let all righteousness be fulfilled. He says, no, I must be baptized. And uh, so he comes. So when you're baptized, if, you, if you're going to be baptized uh, by me on, uh, on June uh, 4th, uh, so I'm going to lower you under the water. Then I'm going to lift you up out of the water. So uh, when we're baptized, it's not us going under the water and us getting up. It's being lowered under the water. Some preachers put one hand under and the other hand on top of their head, kind of symbolic of pushing you under the water. And then you're lifted up out of the water. It's not something, in fact, that we ourselves do. We are baptized. So uh, Jesus, when he is baptized... Uh, and was praying, the heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. 
So the heavens are opened, and what looks like a dove comes down upon him. It's the Holy Spirit. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Let's look over back over on that day of Pentecost in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. And, uh, well, let's put it up here. The, the people all hear Peter then stands up and speaks to the crowd. And basically, uh, he preaches kind of like the way John the Baptist preaches. He, he preaches, he said, look, y'all are the people who shouted crucify and, and, and hung Jesus up on a cross to die. And he lays them low. And so when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Look at verse 38. Peter said to them, repent, so turn. Y'all been going this way. Y'all need to humble yourselves and turn and go this way. Y'all thought this was the right way to go. You need to humble yourself and turn now and go the other direction. Turn to Jesus instead of away from him. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. You don't baptize yourself. You are baptized. Somebody lowers you under the water. Somebody picks you up from the water. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's lift this up, first of all, that you, the power of God comes when we surrender our pride. So we surrender our pride, uh, confessing our sin, acknowledging the sinners that we are, acknowledging that we need to be lowered under the water to be washed clean by the blood of Jesus, and then we need to be lifted up to new life. As long as I think I'm better than someone else on the face of this earth, as long as I think there are others who I am morally superior to, anyone, in fact, on the face of this earth that I think I am better than, the power doesn't come. But when we humble ourselves, when we humble ourselves surrendering our pride, the power of God comes. Now, Jesus went to the waters of baptism without sin. He was without sin. He was perfectly relying upon the Father. But uh, when John says, no, you need to baptize me, Jesus humbly says, no, let it be that I would fulfill all righteousness. He knew the command of God for him to go into that water. He humbled himself by joining with those sinners who were being baptized that day. We humble ourselves, right? Surrendering our pride and the power of God comes. As long as I think I'm better than someone, the power doesn't come, right? I don't grab hold. The Holy Spirit will be there, but I can't grab hold of that power as long as I think I'm better than someone. Years ago, I went to visit somebody up at Rikers Prison up in New York City, and uh, wow, it was quite an experience, and uh, uh, finally you get in, you had to take bus after bus. It's this massive prison, this huge compound. And uh, finally get into the last waiting room and uh, all the women were there going to see their man. It was a man that I was visiting in this part of the prison. And uh, so we were in this huge waiting room twice as big as this, this room, and it was packed solid, and they had these TVs everywhere. This was in the early afternoon, televisions blaring everywhere, and it was all the same stupid afternoon TV show. You know, the, the point of all those incredibly stupid afternoon TV shows is to look at these people who are telling you all the stupid stuff that they've done and all the bad things that they've done. It's the point of it all is for us to look at them and say, at least I'm not that stupid. At least I'm not that bad. And these people are all just laughing and laughing, watching all this stuff. If I have any thought that I'm better than you, I'm better than that addict in the, in the alley, I'm better than this, this murderer in the prison, if I have any thought that I'm better than anyone else, I can't grab hold of that power. And so it was no accident that Peter said, uh, you'll be, ba be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. In other words, confess your sins, ask for forgiveness, humble yourself, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So grabbing hold begins with the surrender of pride. Let's look over in the Gospel of John now, chapter 5, uh, down at verse 19. So here Jesus speaks some words that... Um, they sound surprising when you first hear them. It says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son, meaning himself, can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. 
So he's speaking of himself. He says, I can do nothing of my own accord. In my power, in my wisdom, in my ability, I can do nothing. This, I mean, this doesn't sound like Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus is the one who walked on water. Jesus is the one who touched the eyes of the blind and they saw. Jesus is the one who spoke with such incredible authority and, and wisdom. And here he's the one now saying, I can do nothing of my own accord. So if you see first that, that grabbing hold of the power, the power of the Holy Spirit requires a surrendering of pride. I mean, how many people in, in, in a moment, like, you know, I prayed... Uh, in that it was a hotel room when I was 15 years old, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. How many people in a moment, you know, receive the Spirit of God, but then don't go on to live by the power of the Spirit of God? Well, perhaps they haven't surrendered their pride. And all of us, this is a work, right? It's a work of a lifetime. It's more and more surrendering our pride. Perhaps I haven't surrendered my self-confidence. If I'm going ha- to grab hold of the power of God, I have to surrender all my self-confidence. Now, I know we raise everyone telling them to have confidence in yourself. Self-confidence is considered a virtue. I'm telling you that God does not consider self-confidence a virtue. Here's my Lord saying, I can do nothing of my own accord. Nothing. As long as I think I can do this, then I'm not grabbing hold of the power of God. If as long as I think I can climb this mountain, I have the, the, the courage to face this fear. I, I, I have the ability, yeah, I know I failed a thousand times, but on the thousand first time, I'm going to beat this thing that keeps beating me. As long as I think I can do it, I can't do it. I can't grab hold of that power that God would send to my heart. It's when I come to that place of surrendering self-confidence. It's when, that place, when I come to that place of saying, I can do nothing of my own accord, that I can grab hold of the power of God. Look in 2 Corinthians here, chapter 12. The apostle uh, Paul was um, just continually, uh, well, he was a man of huge pride, of huge self-confidence, uh, and... Uh, uh, and Jesus got hold of him. And this whole letter, this is a letter that he writes to the church in Corinth. Uh, Paul is talking about what happened in his life as uh, the Lord used life to break his self-confidence. He got, the Lord used all the various struggles and problems in life that, uh, that uh, Paul encountered to break this self-reliance so that Paul would understand how to grab hold of the power of God. At the beginning of that letter, that Second Corinthians letter, uh, he, he talks about the time that he was thrown into the, the lion's den in Ephesus. So the Romans, for entertainment, uh, would bring out the prisoners out of their jails and put them in stadiums and let lions and leopards go, and the people would fill the stadium and watch the lions eat the people. Uh, it's just like going to the movies today, I think. And um, so uh, Paul said, we despaired, you know, we were, we were uh, he didn't use the word, but traumatized. We, we, we thought we were dead. He said, but that was to teach us to rely not on ourselves, but on God. Here toward the end of that letter, he speaks about uh, uh, an affliction uh, and what was apparently an eye disease that, that stole his vision and uh, made him blind and gave him a horrible appearance. And he prayed and prayed and prayed for God to heal him. This is beating him down in life. It's taking his strength away from him. He, he, he prayed for God to, to heal him, but here was God's answer. My grace, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. No, Paul, I'm not going to, to heal you of this affliction uh, because my power, you'll grab hold of it. It will be made perfect in your life in your weakness. And so having heard that, having realized this was what God was saying to Paul, Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more. In other words, I'm not going to hide my weaknesses. I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look at verse 10. He says it real clear. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. When he was writing about this affliction, he, he made very clear it wasn't God who sent this affliction to him. He said it was a messenger of Satan. It was the devil who sent this, this disease to him. But Paul says, I'm content with these things 
because they have broken my self-confidence. For when I am weak, when my self-confidence is broken, then I am strong. We grab hold of that power when we surrender then. Pride when we surrender self-confidence. How do you... How do you surrender pride? I mean, how do, you, how do you acknowledge you're no better than anyone else on the face of this earth? I mean, how do you do that? How do you look at the horrible things that we see that people do in this world, and you come to that place where uh, you say, I'm a sinner like him? There's only one way to be able to, to come to that place of, of surrendering, even the pride of saying, I'm at least better than him. It's looking in the eyes of perfect love. It's looking into the eyes of Jesus and realizing that no matter how sinful I am, no matter how poor a job of living I have done, I am loved by God. I can be honest about myself. I can be honest about my sin when I realize how loved I am. I can surrender my pride when I realize how loved I am. I can surrender my self-confidence. How do you let go of self-confidence? Come on, I have to fight my way through life. I've got I've to do what I need to do in life. How can I surrender self-confidence when I look in those eyes of perfect love? When I realize this God loves me with a, a far greater love than I love myself. And this God will give me a much greater strength, a much greater power to do what I truly need to do in life so I can surrender my self-confidence to be able to grab hold of the power of this God who loves me and and knows that I need much more power, much more strength than I have in myself. It all comes with knowing that that incredible love. Let's look over in in that same chapter of John, chapter 5, down at verse 30. Jesus says the very similar thing again. He says, I can do nothing on my own. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear... As I hear the Father speaking to me, as I hear the Holy Spirit within me bearing witness to me, as I hear, I judge. I make my decisions. I I, I receive wisdom. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. I make wise decisions. I, I, I decide wisely because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so finally, we grab hold of the power of God. Again, Jesus saying, I can do nothing on my own. Nothing, he says. But I receive power. I receive wisdom. I hear from uh, the Spirit of God within me because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. We, we grab hold of the power of God when we surrender our will. So even more than surrendering my pride, Most of us eventually can get to that place of surrendering our pride. We realize what sinners we are. Most of us can eventually get to that place of surrendering our self-confidence. We we realize we we need God or, or we just can't do a very good job of living life. But this last one now, surrendering my will. How do I surrender my will? In other words, my ability to decide, the freedom I have to choose what path I will travel. Uh, Jesus is saying, look, I I can do nothing on my own, but I receive power. I hear from God because I have surrendered my will. I've let go. I'm not in charge. Here's Jesus saying, I'm not in charge of my life. I've surrendered my will to the will of the Father. How do we let go of that? Because this comes to the core of what it is to, to, to be a human being, right? That, that deepest place within us is the place where we choose. So we choose to love or not love. We choose to bless or not bless. We choose to obey or not obey. We choose the path that we travel in life. And now you're saying to me, I need to surrender my will even to God. What, are you going to make me into a robot? What is it? Am I just going to be an uh, you know, a, a robot programmed by God with, with no will, no freedom of choice. But here's Jesus who said exactly that. I seek not my will, but the will of him who sent me. Let's look at one last verse. And this again is back to the apostle Paul. So in, in the book of Philippians here. So Paul who, yeah, he was very filled with pride. He was very filled with self-confidence and he was very willful. So you remember the story of Paul. The thing that he was proud about was his, how religious he was. He was 
Uh, he said nobody was more religious than I was. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a, Jew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Nobody obeyed God like I obeyed God. He was very prideful in his, his religiosity and his spirituality. He was very self-confident. He knew what he was doing. You know, he had determined that this Jesus was a blasphemer, that he was evil, that he was wicked, that any followers of Jesus uh, deserved death as Jesus had, had been put to death. And, and he, he was going to make that happen. You, you remember, he's, he, the last we see of Paul, before Jesus gets hold of him, he's got letters from the authorities. He's going up to Damascus to arrest people, to bring them back, to put them to death. And then Jesus knocks him off his feet. Knocks him off his feet. And this, this voice, this bright, shining light blinds Paul. And this voice is saying, Paul, why are you fighting against me? And he's saying, who is it? I am Jesus. Why are you fighting against me? And now, big, bad Paul. Paul, who knows what he's doing at all times. Paul, who thinks that he's so righteous and others are so wicked. Big, bad Paul now gets back on his feet and he's blind and he has to be led by the hand, led by the hand into Damascus. And he has to wait now in a house in Damascus until God gets hold of one of the Christians in Damascus so that Paul had come to arrest to put them to death. God gets hold of one of the Christians there in Damascus and gives him enough courage to go and seek out this Paul, come into the house, and pray for Paul that Paul regain his sight. Paul's pride is humbled. His self-confidence is humbled. And what he tells us here is, as he looks back on it, he surrendered. He had to surrender also his will. So look at this. He says, I count everything as loss. Everything I thought was right, everything I thought that was good, every, everything I thought that I knew what I was doing, how to do it, I had to give it all up. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I, I, I considered I wanted this Jesus more than I wanted even my own ability to decide what I'm going to do in life. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. I gave it up. I gave up the authority I had over my own life. And I considered that simply to be rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I couldn't grab hold of the power of Jesus. I couldn't grab hold of the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent to me unless I gave up even my will. If you were to go to one of the uh, meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, one of the things you might hear there is, come on in, sit down, shut up, and listen. Because what they've understood very clearly is that we spend no time listening. We spend all our time forming our own opinions, thinking that we know what we're doing. And they've, they've understood that what we need to do is sit down, close our mouths, and actually listen, giving up our will, listening for what it is that God would tell me to do. If I can surrender then my will, these things are the work of a lifetime, surrendering my pride, surrendering my self-confidence, surrendering my will. But if I can surrender my will and actually listen. Paul had to listen to someone that he thought was a blasphemer, that he thought was wicked, that he thought was evil. This Christian man who comes and prays, Paul had to keep his mouth shut and listen to receive the power of God, to grab hold of the power of God. And so this is how this, this power that, that is promised to us becomes ours. He's an awesome God, amen? He is an awesome God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We just thank you, Lord God, that you send your spirit to us. You've promised, Lord God, as we look to Jesus, as we put our faith in him, you've promised not only the forgiveness of our sins, but you've promised to fill us with your spirit. Lord God, we pray then, help us as we look into these eyes of perfect love. Lord God, help us then to surrender our pride. Help us to surrender our self-confidence. Help us to surrender our will, Lord God. That like our own Lord and Savior, Jesus, who understood he could do nothing of his own accord, but could do all things in your power, in your strength. Lord God, like our brother Paul, who, who, who had to, to give up everything, Lord God, everything that he thought he could do that he would gain you. Lord God, give us then, as we look into your eyes of love, give us the faith to surrender our will. 
our confidence, our pride. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the wind that's blowing outside this morning. We pray, Father, you would uh, just send a mighty rushing wind to our hearts. Fill us here, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Let's sing.